Together, I would invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter. And we will be reading the first nine verses of 1 Peter. And we're really not supposed to uh, have favorite portions of Scripture as all of God's Word is equally to be revered by us. 1 Peter is a beautiful passage of Scripture, uh, wonderful construction, the language is just absolutely beautiful, and the truths that appear for us here are equally breathtaking. Let's listen with attentive hearts to the reading of the Word of God. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials." that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May God the Holy Spirit be pleased to accompany the reading of his word with his blessing. I think it would be fair to say that as those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, many of us are becoming less and less comfortable in the world. That we are observing and witnessing cultural shifts that increasingly alienate those who profess and hold to biblical, historical Christianity. We're less and less at home. And it makes us uncomfortable. But I want to suggest to you that it might not necessarily be entirely a bad thing. Peter addresses this epistle to the pilgrims, the strangers of the dispersion. He's writing this letter pastorally to converted Jewish believers who, because of their testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, had been displaced from their homes and scattered to other parts of the empire. They were not at home. They were pilgrims. They were unsettled. They were separated from the comforts that many people take for granted. 
But that very station in life that God in His sovereignty had appointed for them was a constant reminder that their citizenship was not of this earth. That their citizenship was in heaven. That they were, in the most ultimate sense, travelers, pilgrims, strangers, moving through this world, but ultimately the possessors and the inheritors of a better place. And so Peter addresses addresses these pilgrims of the dispersion and seeks to comfort them and to direct them to ideas and thoughts and truths that would serve as an anchor for them moving through a world that was strange and where they were regarded as strangers. Peter himself struggled. We think about the character of Peter as we read about him in the gospel narratives. Peter didn't always get it right the first time. We might think of Peter as being somewhat impulsive, somewhat given to extremes. He would react in the moment and then later have to change course and readjust. Remember Peter at the foot washing when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet? Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And once Jesus explained to him, oh, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter who said, Lord, I will never deny you. And then denied him three times. Peter who, even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the midst of his ministry as an apostle, had to be rebuked by the apostle Paul for swaying to peer pressure when he was among the Judaizers. Peter waffled many times. And he had to learn this lesson himself. How to be anchored in an unstable world. Even with unstable hearts, which we all have. And so as Peter begins to write this epistle to the strangers of the dispersion, He writes to them of doctrine. Interesting. Peter doesn't give them object lessons. He doesn't give them quaint stories designed to bolster them up. Peter gives them theology. He gives them doctrinal truth that would be the undergirding of their understanding of themselves and of the world in which they found themselves and ultimately of God and His Son Jesus Christ and their inheritance ultimately in Him. So I'd like to walk us through these nine verses this morning and take a look specifically at these doctrinal truths that Peter points his audience to. Because these are the same doctrinal truths that serve as a foundation and as an undergirding for us as we find ourselves pilgrims in a strange land. What's the first truth that Peter directs his audience to? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter begins this pastoral letter designed to encourage these saints by reminding them of the doctrine of election. You are elect. You are chosen. 
before the foundation of the world. Your salvation, your standing, your place before God and in this world is anchored in the choice of the sovereign God to set you apart. A choice that he made before the foundation of the world. The structure of this reminder that Peter gives them of their election is quite striking and beautiful. You see the Trinitarian nature of this statement and how he breaks this down when he describes election. He says, you are elect according to, that's literally from, the source, the starting point, from, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in or through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto or toward obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So we see that concept, that doctrine of election moving through the persons of the Trinity, each of them fulfilling their particular function or role in the accomplishment and communication of that glorious election for the benefit of God's people. You are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The word foreknowledge that is used there is a word that literally means prognosis. That's the Greek word behind it. You think of the word prognosis as something that's associated with the medical field, right? We hear about somebody who is ill and they've been seen by the doctors and tests have been run. We say to that person, well, what, what's the prognosis? Well, the prognosis is good. Or, no, well, the prognosis is not great. It's an anticipation of what will be the outcome of that particular situation. Peter says to these folks, you are elect according to the prognosis of God the Father. That's a good prognosis. God the Father has determined in the councils of eternity that those whom he has chosen and drawn to himself through sanctification of the Spirit by the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, will persevere unto the end and be saved. So the doctrine of election, reminding us of, of who we are in God's mercy and grace, is a source of confidence in the midst of uncertainties in this world and in the midst of trials. <coughs> Excuse me. The doctrine of election produces Christ-centered behavior in those to whom it is applied. Why did God choose you? For what purpose? Unto what end? Well, Peter tells us here, it's unto obedience, unto conformity to the will and to the purpose of God. So in the midst of the first century, as these saints scattered throughout these various locations, struggled with the uncertainty surrounding them, Peter reminds them first and foremost, you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The next thing Peter reminds them of is their regeneration. Look at verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 
who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter reminds them not only that God chose them before the foundation of the, of the world, that the foundation of their confidence and their hope in this world was the electing grace of God the Father, but that God then applied that electing grace to them specifically in causing them to be new people. They were born again to a living hope, transformed and changed by the grace of God. Peter states this in the form of an exclamation of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. That doctrine of regeneration provoked from the heart of the apostle an exclamation of praise. R.C. Sproul once referred back to a statement that had been made by one of his professors in Amsterdam, G.C. Burkauer, that made a lasting impression on him and that he never forgot. The statement was that all sound theology must begin and end with doxology. All sound theology must begin and end with doxology. The praise of God is the beginning and the end of truth. This truth of the regenerating grace of God as a result of his abundant mercy, transforming sinners from lost and under condemnation to found and under the kingdom of his glorious Son, is a doctrine that ought to provoke praise to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Is that your sense? As you think of yourself and your position before God through Jesus Christ, if you are a new creature in Christ, and you claim that you have been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, does the realization of that on a daily basis provoke from your heart exclamations of praise, glory to God the Father for this grace and this mercy that has been bestowed upon you. We are born again, says Peter, according to His abundant mercy. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born again, says Peter, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The power by which we have been transformed and made new creatures in Christ is the very same power by which God demonstrated His glory in raising His Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. That same resurrection power has raised you from the dead and brought you into life. We are born again to a living Hope. Hope, as it's defined in Scripture, is very different from hope the way that it's used in our modern vernacular. We talk about hope as referring to something uncertain. We're not really sure it could go this way, it could go that way, but we really hope that it'll go this way. The Bible, in its references to hope, refers to something certain. The hope that is an anchor for the soul. The hope that is rooted in the promises of God. And if God says that this is what's going to happen, then that's what's going to happen. And that is my hope. And I hang my confidence upon that hope as something that I know is going to take place because God said so. And even though I haven't seen it happen yet, I know it will. 
We are born again to a living hope. We steer through this world and through its many obstacles and the treacherous manifestations of trials and tribulations. And yet we have the confidence as those who are elect according to God's grace and born again to a living hope that God will work out His purposes and His promises around us and bring them to fruition. We're born again, says Peter, to an inheritance. There is an end in sight. There is a goal. And the goal is our inheritance. We are promised an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. Peter's invoking the idea of an inheritance. We might think of that in this you know, earthly, earthly realm as inheriting some great fortune from a relative that's passed away. But anything that we inherit in this world is ultimately going to be frittered away. It's going to be gone. It might be corruptible. It might be defiled. It might ultimately fade. But our heavenly inheritance, Peter says, can be subject to none of those corrupting influences. It will, in fact, remain. And it will remain forever. And Peter says that it's reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved. The word reserved literally means guarded to prevent loss or injury. You think about an image from, from the world, something like Fort Knox. Guarded so that no one can approach and spoil what's inside of there. But the inheritance that we have in heaven is more impenetrable than that. It's guarded, it's reserved by the power of God Himself so that it cannot be taken away. If you are in Christ, you have that confidence. Jesus, the great shepherd who said, no one will snatch you out of my hand. The doctrine of regeneration produces a conscious dependence upon God. We have been born again. And so as little children we come before Him, dependent upon His grace. The doctrine of regeneration produces an unshakable hope, an eternal perspective, and a sense of what is truly valuable. Peter goes on in verse 5 to point his readers to the truth of perseverance. In this, this living hope that he's just referred to, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He gets down now to brass tacks. We have these truths, we have these doctrines, and they undergird our faith, and they give us reason for praising God. They lift our spirits, and they cause our souls to rejoice. That God has elected us by His grace and by His mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, a hope that anticipates an inheritance that is waiting for us, that cannot be taken away, and that can never fade. And yet we live in the midst of trials. And so Peter comes back to earth here in verse 5. In this you greatly rejoice, verse 6 rather, though now for a little while, if need be, you experience various trials. He qualifies the trials He places them into that greater perspective. He's just set the stage with visions of eternity. And now he says, for a little while. Now, 
for a little while. The for a little while kind of mitigates the situation, but the now is where the sting is. But Lord, what's going on now? Yes, I agree, all of those things are true. And I profess my belief in, in the doctrine of election and, and, the, and that I'm born again unto a living hope. But now, I'm troubled, I'm grieved by various trials. Peter says, that may be so, if need be. Trials serve a purpose. In the ultimate grand scheme, the trials are there for a reason. If need be, for a little while, you may now be grieved by various trials. Why? What's that if need be? Well, Peter tells us that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God uses the trials. As we walk through this pilgrimage to test and refine us, to sharpen our faith, to polish our purity, to conform us more and more into the image of His beloved Son. And so those trials don't just happen randomly and for no purpose and no reason, though oftentimes it may seem that that is so. But behind every one of them, is a sovereign purpose of Almighty God to refine us, to perfect us, to transform us, to shape us for the ultimate purpose that having gone through them, God may be glorified and praised and held in honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing magnifies God in this world quite like the testimony of a believer in Jesus Christ who in spite of the most grievous trials manifests the confidence and the peace and the grace of a follower of Christ, who is able to say in the midst of trials that they count it all joy, that they see and understand that regardless of what they're going through, God is accomplishing His purposes. So Peter directs his readers to that doctrine of God's providence and the ultimate perseverance of the saints, that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need fear no evil, for God is with us. And finally, Peter directs them to the doctrine of their union with Christ. That these things may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, he says, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter separates himself at this place from his readers by talking to them about their experience. Peter, as an apostle, had actually seen the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He realized that his readers did not share in that blessing. They didn't have that experience. They had never laid eyes upon Jesus in the flesh. And yet Peter magnifies the love that they have for Christ in spite of the fact of not having physically seen him. Having not seen, you love. And though you don't see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That's the doctrine of our union with Christ. We know that Jesus Christ lives, that he is resurrected from the dead, that he dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. But we've never seen him. We've seen his effects. We've seen the amazing transformation that he accomplishes in the lives of his people. And the reality of his resurrection as the word of God by the spirit of God is implanted in the hearts of people and transforms them from darkness to light, redounds to the glory of the Lord and testifies to the reality of the living Savior about whom we testify. And so, in the grace of our living Savior, we are able to transcend trials. We are able to navigate through the twists and the pitfalls of the strange world in which we live, looking forward to the confident hope that we have in Him that awaiting us and being guarded for us by the power of God is an inheritance that can never fade away. And looking behind us to the foundation of our hope and confidence in the electing grace of God and the power of His Holy Spirit in giving us new life and causing us to be new creatures in Christ. We are able to praise God and to exalt Him and to walk in confidence and in hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, You are glorious and an awesome God, and we thank You for the promises that You give to us in Your Holy Word. We thank You that Your truth is an anchor for our souls. We thank you that your spirit promises to work through your word. We pray that that would indeed be the case, that your word, as was prayed earlier, would not return unto you void, but would accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Encourage our hearts. Strengthen our joy. Cause us to grow in our understanding of you and of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in our faithfulness as we pursue his glory in walking through this foreign land in which we temporarily live. Give us the hope, Father, and magnify that hope of what awaits us, but cause us to be faithful here as we seek to glorify you in our words, in our thoughts, in our deeds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number two, O Worship the King.